The 29th of April 2023 will go down as one of the most memorable days of my life. The Journey Guantu podcast had its very first live event. I shared a stage with people whom I have looked up to for nearly the entire existence of this podcast and beyond. It is still a mystery to me how exactly this event came together so well and I hope that one day I can make sense of it. But beyond the event itself, the theme of that day is something that I can say I had developed an obsession for for just over a year. Since the beginning of last year, I have been consumed by a desire to understand what it is that happens when we die. I didn't want to know it in a philosophical abstract way. I wanted to know it in as practical a manner as humanly possible from this side of the veil. I spent this time since last year wanting to know what happens the moment when your breath leaves your body. Where do you go? What do you see? And where exactly are our ancestors? What kind of existence do they have? What do they do on a daily basis? What does their world look like? And from their perspective, what is the purpose of their existence in that space? I wanted to know from the African spiritual perspective, how does one become an ancestor? What exactly is the process? And why is it that our relationship with those who have passed on is structured in the particular way that it is. Somewhere during the planning of this event, it became very clear that this whole project had a life of its own. One of the strangest moments was when I got messages from those who had received their invites to the event in spirit. I would get messages from people telling me that they dreamt that I had invited them to this event that had all kinds of healers in attendance. And this was mid last year. At the time, the whole thing was still just a thought in my head. It was as though my guides had started organizing their version of the event on their side and had already started sending out invites way before I even had decided if I was going to go ahead with it or not. Putting together a public event that is aimed at bringing people together to specifically engage on and discuss spirituality was one of the most daunting aspects of this whole project. Especially under the climate around African spirituality in our media space where it has been sensationalized and turned into a kind of spectacle for likes and clickbait. But in the end, I walked away from this event with no attachment to it. None whatsoever. There was no point where I felt that this was my thing or this was my moment. If my ancestors would ever want me to do this event ever again, I would call up the squad like Nick Fury calling up the Avengers and we would give it our 110%. I have to say that I had an absolutely magical team. If I had to do this all over again, it would be so that I could work with such beautiful beings again. If it is never required of me, then this event was the first and the last and I am perfectly fine either way. What needs be, will be. What truly did amaze me is that so many people were guided to be part of this process and the event. Like people's ancestors wanted their children to meet in a space and participate in what my people wanted to put together. The idea of the meetings and discussions between different groups of guides that were all agreeing to make this happen... That is really what hit me the hardest about this whole event. Then our first aid teams were kept busy. We made sure that we created spaces that were private and safe for people if they needed the privacy should spirit move, as it were. 
our teams were on hand should anyone avugelo elizozi and abantabatala needed a person to commune with and share messages with and just be treated with humility and reverence. I shared the stage with Koko Obri Machikli and Mkulu Makanya, who were both past guests on the podcast, and I really believe that they are the embodiment of the teachers that this generation really needs and deserves. I was like a toddler on a sugar rush listening to them speaking. I could have sat there the whole day, and I honestly don't know what I was doing on that stage myself. Initially, I was going to host the event, but the team decided otherwise. They felt that we needed another presence on stage, someone who would be able to ground the whole thing while I would be listening and taking notes and things like that, because I would easily get distracted. So we decided to have a host other than me. And that host was Muafrika Wamukati, who was also a past guest on the podcast. Good God. What a power, what a force, what beauty, what intellect and what sheer art and grace that she is. I generally don't fully grasp what the term holding space means, but I felt held on that day throughout the entire event by her sheer presence alone. To end the event, we held a prayer for our ancestors and Bushle Bendalo guided us through the most profound experience of the event. After she finished, I walked off stage and I simply broke down. I wept like a baby. I'm not entirely sure why, but it just happened. And I think at the core of it, it was really a sense of deep gratitude that the event itself happened and that I had been entrusted with such work and it went so beautifully as it did. Ultimately, this wasn't my moment. This was a moment. One that I will be eternally grateful to have been allowed to witness. And I would like to share this moment with you. Well, part of it anyway. This is going to be a shortened version of a five-hour event. And I sincerely hope that you enjoy it and you find it as insightful and as educational as I did. And to everyone who attended from the very bottom of my heart, Nyabong. In course. Kiria 
ke la rang wa la botshiba ba ra topa le rotso la godu le rotso la godu a le lebe ke nna setlogolo sa modi ba mmalefokana a gothwana marawa maulo setlogolo sa ga ba masekela ba sekela ba itswa Rhodesia ba re ke ba mam nyam nyam nyokololo ba go nya ba sa fetse ba re fele setjang mo pao ga yo nya fela ga e ja ga fele setswe ga re rogane ke mothepe mwa ba kwena ba kwena ba ila le tlhaka ba roka ba metse a pula ke nna setlogolo sa ga ba mafa mo sa di puthi ba re mo Afrika re o kwele we ka na tau we ka na kwena o nyaka enge ka ka re pelo ithupilwe pelo ithupilwe ke lebetse ka kiba kiba ya ge sho ke bontsha ba kgekolo dithogolo pelo ithupilwe se ngumvu bu nguma khasane nguma kasela silo samanzi pelo ithupilwe le le melona le re ke mopedi thwi thobel Ah, that hand clap. <laughs> it's lukewarm. <laughs> I greet you all. I've already introduced myself. Kena mo Africa waga mo khati, khadi kulu yaga mo khati, meaning that I am the one who transfers the knowledge systems of Baga mo khati and the lineage of Baga Mukhati. And I do that with pride, and I introduce myself in that way because of I am here alone, but we stand as many. Uh, I am very much honored to have you today and to have the entourage that you are with today to hold space together. We are holding space together as we are trying to find meaning about ourselves. Can I see them please? About ourselves as the black people. I have house rules for everyone, including myself. As much as I'm wearing my lovely dress and you have seen the speakers and you would like to take pictures of them, we request that we don't have flesh. You know, ereber ka le batho ba moya, ara ba tlo re 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 shushumetse dilo tse dintsha ker. Langwishisha ker. Thank you. And also taking of videos, uh, let's do it in moderation to avoid, uh, there's a, a, a piracy company called Mandela something. You know, you just see all the movies, you can see all the, we don't want to see the happenings of today like that type of Mandela piracy system. We know that, I know most of you have, have, have watched the Mandela pirates. Bon, wahan. <laughs> So the limiting of recordings, so we are waiting that a person for the whole duration can just be sitting there and taking videos. But just snippets, 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 not throughout. We'll appreciate that so much. And also the restrooms that are just here downstairs. Um, the ladies, it's on the left, and the gents, it's on the right. If there are any binary people, we do apologize on behalf of the venue. They are not advances yet. So, whichever gender you prefer, uh, also, it is important to mention the nature of the topic uh, that we have a come room. And we understand the people, some, some of you, someone said, come, it will be nice, you will learn something. But if you feel like it's a bit too much, the conversation is getting too much and you want some, a little bit of time, you know, uh, to, to recoup, to recuperate, come back, we have what we call a calm room. 
So there are gents and ladies who are wearing Guantu t-shirts. Then you can just pull them aside and say, please usher me to the come room. And kale kale masuika salebuleta. Someone said, if you want to know where you are going, you need to know where you come from. And some of you, like I said, maybe they said, come along. You might just learn something. It is important that we start or whichever way you please, to call the light bearer of the podcast. So for some of you who don't know, Journey to Guantu, it's an audio space where you can explore about African spirituality. And it's the first time where we have an audience. But why is that important? So that we, can, we are able to interact. You don't have to wait for two days for whoever is running the online platforms to respond. So you have the leverage to be asking questions. So if you have a notebook or maybe on your phone, while the conversation is going on, you can take notes. We will have a Q&A after each and every speaker. We will have five questions after if each and every speaker. And then we will have a panel discussion. Then we will have a lengthier conversation. So if you don't get a chance to pose a question after the speaker, just make a note of that. Then uh, we'll, they will uh, be willing to answer. But also after... After the event, or maybe during the intervals, you can just grab one of the speakers by the hand and you know, ask them to elaborate, share contacts for further clarity. We understand what if you are drawn to uh, someone on the panel, of course, and then you want to you know, utilize their services, uh, you will have that conversation with them. Pelekia Lolololo, I'm going to ask you to help me welcome the torchbearer of Jenny Tukwandu, Ovosmuzi Ngande, with a round of applause. record the podcasts in my wardrobe at home. It's a closet, and I open the doors, and I hang clothes to make soundproofing. And now we're here. <laughs> I can't tell you how crazy this is right now. Um, it's such a moment. Um, and we've come very far. I actually recognize a lot of faces. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we don't know what we're doing. We really don't know what we're doing. This thing came, and now we're here. Um, but I am not oblivious to the seriousness of what we are attempting to do. And I'm not oblivious to the fact that for a lot of you, talking about death and dying and what comes after could be a very touching moment. Before I start with my part of the talk, there's something that I want to ask you. I need you to question everything that I'm going to tell you. I need you to question every single thing that I'm going to say. And the reason I say that is not so that you can prove what I'm saying is right or wrong, or if it's true or false, but it's to try to use questions as a tool rather than as a problem. 
right? When it comes to spirituality, we tend to view problem um, questions as a problem. We see them as a roadblock. We see them as a wall. We see them as something that essentially shouldn't be there. For me, questions, and especially questions around spirituality, are markers on a map, right? When I have a question, the question gives me direction. If there's something I want to know, I go there. If I have a question about something, I go there, right? So the reason I, I, I want to emphasize this is because our religious backgrounds have made having questions shameful, right? You feel ashamed for having questions. And currently, how we, we engage with African spirituality, there's shame in having questions because you feel like you're surrounded by people who know. Everyone seems to know better than you. And as a result, when you have, when you have view a question with shame, you actually view the process of how you got to the question itself shameful, right? Not only then are you not comfortable with having the question, you're not comfortable with how you got to that question, right? So in all the things that I'm going to tell you, my, my hope is that you are going to embrace questions, not as a challenge, but more as an opportunity, right? Don't be shamed, ashamed of having questions. I'll, I'll give you a simple example. Um, a show of hands. How many people can admit that they actually don't know what an ancestor actually is? I'll go first. Is it everyone who died? Is it some people? Is, does, does Umalume boy, boy who lives a back room, the one who drank himself to death, does he become an ancestor too? And why is it that only Isangoma have Amazozi and you have ancestors? Right? I have those questions. I don't fully understand it. So what you do then, you take all of these questions and you use them as markers on a map. You say, is it everyone? That's the mark on the map. Turn left. Is it only some people? You go that direction. Turn right you follow all those points where they go. And the crazy thing is about spirituality is that you could get to the other side and still not have an answer. But not only do you have a wealth of experience, but you also have better understanding of other things because you, you, you get answers to questions that you actually didn't even know that you had. Right? So that's my plea. Uh, embrace the process. Embrace the process of getting to questions. Use questions as a tool, not as a problem. Be proud of the questions that I have. If I did not have, if I did not have pride in my questions, we all wouldn't be here. Because I'd be sitting in my own corner feeling scum for not knowing certain things. Right. So that's my simple advice to you. Embrace your questions. They are not a problem. They are your guide. So... What I'm going to share with you is information. It is not spiritual knowledge. It's not spiritual insights. It is information. I need to emphasize this because later on I'm going to come back to why this is only information. The, the information that I'm going to share with you is based on books and literature and research papers that I've been reading over the past couple of months since last year. And none of them, none of the information that I'm going to share with you propose a specific kind of belief system. They don't adhere to any kind of faith or practice. If you're familiar with the podcast, you will know that my contribution is always research. Right? I'll always give you a, a historical context to, to a certain topic, 
or something that I've, I've sat and learned. That's also another thing that delays topics. Because it takes weeks sometimes. You read books, you find papers, you watch documentaries, try, try to trace all the source of material and things like that. So the information that I'm going to share with you is based on people's experiences, right? For example, if all of us here said we saw a green elephant when we were driving here, for example. No one can prove it, but we have all experienced it. What does that mean? If large groups of people have experienced something without even knowing each other, they've experienced something objectively, but no one can prove it, what is it? So that is the kind of information that I'm going to share with you. Information that is based on people's experiences and my interpretations of what those experiences could mean, right? So the topic is Into the Ancestral Realm, which talks about what happens after you die. But where I want to start, I want to start with the process of dying, right? Many of you are familiar with near-death experiences, right? You've, you've heard of them? Yeah. But I also need to clarify the near-death experiences are not that one time you nearly got hit by a car or you, you nearly fell off the balcony. It's not something nearly happening, right? Near-death experiences are qualified as, are classified under a situation where a person actually dies. The car actually hits you. You actually fall over the balcony and you die. It's clinical death in the sense that your heart stops beating and your brain stops functioning. But they are called near-death experiences because when they are awoken, they come back with large volumes of memories of what happened. They tell you of many different experiences, places, things, people that, have, that they have experienced in that time when they were classified as clinically dead. The, the research that I'm going to share with you is based on the writings of um, Dr. Raymond Moody. He's a, a medical doctor and a psychiatrist. Here's why, I, I wanna take you through the process of how I research and how I choose what kind of information to take and what kind of information to leave as a way that you can also use it for yourself, right? So. He wrote the book, um, Life After Life, in 1975, where he got a group of people who were basically saying that they died, they were classified dead by physicians and doctors in a hospital, but they came back with experiences. And the reason I chose this particular route is because he wrote the book in 1975. One, there was no internet, right? Two, he coined, it was he who coined the phrase near-death experience. Meaning that before he wrote the book, people didn't know what it is that they were experiencing, number one. Number two, because there was no internet, no one, people who were experiencing it didn't know of another person who was experiencing it. Right? So for me, that speaks to a certain level of authenticity in the, peop in that, the fact that people are sharing. If, if you thought you were the only one who saw a green elephant, you'll probably keep quiet. Right? And you wouldn't know that another, everyone here experienced it. So essentially what he did was he found people who seemed to have gone through the same experience, but without an understanding of what that was. So what are the classical indications of a near-death experience? Oh, before I get to that, you, you will realize as I'm telling you this information that most of it is located in the Western world. Right. A lot of this information that, that is documented talks about documents, the experiences of, of people in America, in Britain, and whatever. There's one main reason for that, and that's because near-death experiences generally, majority of the time, they involve a kind of medical interve intervention of some kind. You need to get help with a doctor um, or the hospital. So there was this one man who, he was having a heart attack, right? And he called, he was American, and he called 911. And 
the ambulance arrived while he was having the heart attack. And then he collapsed and then had his near-death experience. If you have a heart attack and you call 10 triple one, you are dying <laughs> on call. Because you just hear also if you're saying, Ooh, to feel yes. So there is that discrepancy, but I'll get in more into that later. So there is that discrepancy. So it's another point that I'm saying that when you're doing research, you have to be aware of the bias of the information that you're reading. These are people, white people, white writing about their experiences. And I'm going to tell you how they differ with indigenous people. Right. First thing, and these don't go in chronological order. Anything can happen to anyone. Out of body experience. When people die, the one thing that seems to, to be a very common theme is that they have this sense that they don't have a parameter. Like they come out of their body and they're like, I feel like I'm everywhere. I can see everything all around. And for those who would be like in hospitals, they can move around. People who've had near-death experiences can move around in places. And it's the hospital experiences that have actually made signs to, to be challenged by disproving it. Because what would happen is that people would have accounts of things that happened while they were dead, but they could tell you what actually happened in the hospital. Right? Um, there, was a, there was a lady who, I think she had a car accident or something, and she was in a coma in the ICU. And when she had her out-of-body experience, she moved around um, through, the, into the, through the hospital and went into the, into the waiting room where her family was gathered. And then she noticed that her child, her daughter, was wearing mismatched slippers. Right? But this time, she's classified dead, right? So eventually, they managed to resuscitate her weeks later out of the coma. And when the family came, she asked about why was so-and-so wearing you know, unmatching slippers. And her sister, like, got a shock because when that happened, when they got a call that she was in hospital, she was looking after the child. And she said, I just grabbed what I could so we could rush to the hospital. So even the family wasn't aware that the child was not, was not wearing matching slippers. But the sister was like, yes, actually, because when I got home, I looked at them and I felt a bit embarrassed, you know. So when, when science says it do not exist, it can't explain Things like that. Another lady, she, I think she was having a heart attack. Um, and there's a particular drug that they have to give, sorry. There's a particular drug that they have to give you to sort of restart your heart. So, but she was dead at the time. And the doctor asked the nurse to go into where they keep the medicines in the hospital. It's like another room. And this particular medicine, in order to get it into the syringe, you have to snap the neck of it, the glass neck, and then you suck it out through there. But... How you have to do it is that you have to wrap the vial in, in um, paper, uh, what's this, a towel paper, paper towel, because it could cut you when, you when you're snapping it. But because the nurse was in a panic, she just snapped the thing with her fingers and got the thing out, and then they managed to give the lady an injection. When she came back, this old lady, she turns to the nurse and says, don't do that. And they're like, what? Like, don't snap the thing with your, with your fingers because you're going to get cut. There is no way that a normal person would have known this is how this particular drug is taken out of that. So another interesting thing is that is when people talk about those experiences is the expanse of their consciousness. Like they're like, I, f I don't feel like I have a body and I feel like I am everywhere all at once, but also I feel big, right? So in some instances when they come back into their body. Some people have a dilemma like, I can't get into that body. It's too small because I feel like I'm the size of a planet. So it, it would be difficult for me to, to get back into it. And there's always like a sense of, a, of, of disappointment when, when, when that happens. And so the next thing um, with, with after the leaving of the body, um, is the, actually no, before we get there, right. In the process of trying to find your body or leaving your body, a strange thing that happens is that the minute you leave your body, you lose sentimental connection with it. 
a lot of people, when they die and they leave their bodies, they actually can't recognize their body. There was a soldier who, who got injured in, in, in a war, and then they took his body to the, to the hospital, to the military hospital, and he died there. And he says he was out of his body, and he was moving around the ward, and he, couldn't, he, and he kept moving past his own body. And he says, I couldn't recognize it because I did not have that connection with that body. And the only way he actually recognized it was with his wedding ring. It was a particular design, and that's how he recognized it. Right. So what happens is that, you know, when have you ever been in a car accident and got out of it without a scratch? You know, I've, I've had that. So you get into a car accident, you come out without a scratch. Luckily for you, your insurance is good. Right. So what happens is that you get out of it. It's written off. Um, you deal with uh, tow truck people. Maybe you'll have a friend or a relative who's going to come pick you up. You get into the other car. You look at the wreck of your car. You're like, you carry on. That is literally what happens when you die. You look at your body, you're like, <laughs> you feel that this is the vehicle that I had been traveling right up until this point, and then I move on. There's another car I'm going to get. So the transition from, from life to death is almost logical, like, oh, okay, I died. That body looks weird. But oh, I didn't know that I look like that. I look older. I look younger. I look, you know what I mean? But there's, there's almost an instantaneous disconnection with the body. And for me, that, that says a lot, you know, about how we, we so heavily identify with ourselves and our race, our gender, our culture, our country. That the minute you die, all of that, in some instances, just disappears, you know. And you actually have no, no remorse not even remorse, but you don't feel guilt. So, the second thing, this is the one we, 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 we all know about, and that is the light at the end of the tunnel. Right. Um, the light at the end of the tunnel is, is like a typical example of, it, it's the thing we hear in the movies a lot. We hear in the movies, uh, so I saw the light at the end of the tunnel, and this and this and this happened. But here's where an interesting thing happens across cultures, right? In the majority of the research, the light and the end of the tunnel is a white people experience, right? It's, it's tricky to understand why exactly. There's, because some, one, one researcher said, is maybe it's because in indigenous places there are no tunnels. There are no trains moving through. Historically, there are no trains moving through things, you know. So what happens, indigenous people don't, have, don't go through a tunnel. Indigenous people, they cross rivers. They climb mountains. They, they, they enter forests. Some of them enter lakes. They enter caves. Right? That is one of the distinct features of how is seemingly um, culture can dictate what it is that you experience in, in the afterlife. One of the most important things that I'm going to spend more time on is the council. Um, and I'm sure you've all heard of the council. It's in the Bible, the divine council, the divine this, um, the council of elders, right? That's where, and people have had dreams like this where I, I had a dream where I was looking at people and they were sitting around the table and it felt like they were making decisions about my life. Those kind of experiences. So those, that actually happens. And the council actually happens on, on multiple dimensions at the same time, right? Um, a simple thing, right? We would be, a simple example, we're sitting around the table and it's me and the people that I'm coming into the next life with. Right? We're making decisions, right? Each of us have been given an assignment of how you can achieve spiritual growth through human incarnation, right? And we all have different questions. So we'll be sitting around the table, and we'll be like, okay, um, maybe in this life I'm going to learn about love. So all the people you're sitting around the table with, you're like, okay, um, I can help you with that. You know, I'll be your boyfriend, I'll be your other boyfriend, I'll be your ex. 
I'll be your loving mother, I'll be your abusive father, I'll be, you know, we, we sit and we compare notes, right? That's on the one level, when I say that it happens on multiple levels. That's on the one level, right? On the next level, it's not just me and the people that I'm coming into the world with, or rather my direct um, family. It's also my community, right? There's a higher way, like, the numbers increasing of the people, you know? So it starts with your immediate family, the friends, the friends that you're going to have, and your community, your country, your planet. So it, it just keeps going higher and higher, right? And you also have to understand that when you are sitting at the table, you're not just sitting with... It's cool, you, you, get, you, you get to pick your best friend. You're like, oh, cool. This life, let's do it again. You're my homie. Let's roll. I don't know what level of ride or die that is, but rather we ride forever, you know. And I'm sure you're familiar with this. Your best friend could have been your mother. Your best friend could have been your brother, whatever the, the role. But there's a certain group click that you keep coming back with. But also the people you don't like. The people that, you're gonna, that are going to do horrible things to you. They're also sitting around the table. And you're also making decisions, right? So remember I touched on the idea of soul ties, because we think that you go have one night stand, that's a soul tie. The soul tie happens at the table, where you're like, okay, I'm going to test you on this. Or you say, I need testing on this particular thing, because this is a lesson I want to go into. I need someone to test me on it. Loyalty. I want to see if I can actually be faithful in this life. I'm like, okay, cool. I got you. Let's do this. 25 years into your life, you meet the guy or the girl, Everything shuts down. And it's because it's not a physiological response. It is a soul response to this person. Right? And the agreement was, I wanna, you want to see that you can actually live through this. You can handle yourself. Sometimes you get it right. Sometimes you don't. But that's where the soul tie actually happens. Right? So you're coming into this life. You're sitting, I think it's a, a very good way of putting it for me is to understand it as a school, right? You are you know, like group projects. Sorry, guys. Life is a group project. <laughs> There's no way around it. So imagine you're in class and you are given, you are going into like different groups, right? And all of you are given different assignments. You sit in your group and you figure out, okay, this is what I'm going to do. In that group, you probably have your tutors as well, you know, who are going to oversee, okay, will this work, will that work, I'm not sure. But because it's a classroom, there's a teacher, right, who's, who oversees that particular group or that particular class, right? And if you follow that logic, you will understand how a, a group of people, a family, can have a, an overall ancestor or a god of the family. That because there's someone overseeing that particular group of people. But if you use the school analogy, you can also extend it and say, you're in class, you're in biology, right? Biology could be, this is the anger class. This is love. This is happiness. This is ingenuity, you know? You know how in high school, the, the, the class stays the same? and then the teachers rotate. So you could actually be in multiple um, classes with the same people, right? Meaning that you're actually here on different kinds of assignments. And just like in class, in school, there are, th there are people who are going to do better in certain things and worse in certain things. You come into a life, you're good at finances. Someone else is not. But that person is good at something else. Right. Another way that you can that you can look at it, and it's a way that is always uh, uh, challenging, especially within African spirituality. And this thing, Yoguti, how does Umalume Poi Poi become my guide? He was a drunk, Araspani, Pemi PP the whole day, and then he goes, and then Koko tells me like, no, he's your guide kind of a thing, right? Here's my interpretation through this information of how 
that can happen, right? You can be someone's spirit guide and still come back in another life. Example, in this life, you're a good healer. Let's say you're a doctor. You're a brilliant doctor. And you can diagnose and you can treat because there's a way in which you were able to connect with illness beyond the physical, right? You can connect with its true metaphysical sense and its essence. Then you die, right? You become that great-great-grandfather who people will say, you, you know, your great-grandfather was a healer and Ufnukniga is kwam, right? And you become that person's guide through the gift that you were good at when you were here. But when you were here, you were also an alcoholic, right? So you're not done. So you come, you guide this person in whichever way you can guide them, and then you have to come back again and deal with the abuse that you, 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 you put on other people. You come back to deal with all the hurt that you caused. And you, you could come back and then that healing thing is actually dormant because that, you, you, you got marks for that, you know. So these are what I would do. Valenting um, in our presence, Kali Dumedis, but sorry, Baron Bonghono Levanta Tamoholo Valenting Hararona Kali Dumedis. My brothers and sisters, I greet you, um, our children uh, among us, I greet you. I was born in Po Makanya and got initiated as a healer. Um, and through my process of initiation, I got the name Makanya Gute. So I now go by the name Makanya Gute Makanya. Uh, and I got initiated in 2016, and I took a break from the name Mpo um, until recently, where I got to appreciate where my mother was coming from when she gave me the name Mpo. And I just want to... Uh, could someone just... The yellow light's going through my eyes. Do we have... Hey, it's not romantic. Though. Um, it's only recently where I tried to, okay, it's white light now, that I got to appreciate where mom was coming from when she named me Mpo. And this is where I want to start my talk um, on the theme uh, ancestral realms. I would like you to try to remember the story around your birth and episodes around your birth. <clears throat> the most common story that we often hear in circles of healers when you go and consult with healers is that umundu uh, uzale embe that's the first thing. Kind of what's the fancy English word when someone is born and covered with a, with a, I don't know. What's it called in English? That's the one, right? And then you get other kind of people who are born and there's 
violence that surrounds their birth. Basically, it's not a normal, peaceful, harmonious birth, right? How you come into the planet is indicative of where you come from as a spirit. And it is indicative of your life mission. The processes that we go through that are called sitzo, called mieto, amasigo, are processes that are there to help the soul either remember where it is coming from or to help integrate the soul into this planet. So the manner in which we come into this world is indicative of something foreign about this place that we call Earth or the place that we stay in because we need to perform rituals in order to allow the psyche to settle in here, to allow the consciousness or the spirit to settle in here, as well as to allow the body to settle in here. And that process of facilitating, you know, the, the trying to get all the aspects of self to settle here, are then carried in what we call rituals or sezo or isintu uh, or mieto. Are we together? So once your parents or whoever was there helping you come into the planet gives you details of how you came into the planet, you will then get an idea of the kind of soul that you are. The two people, the two kinds of people that I've explained, violence and uzele umbete, the first thing is that they are healers. Now, in this time in South Africa, it is very dangerous to refer to someone as a healer because we all want positions and we all want beads and we all want a big following. We all want to burp and we all want muti and we all want to be gorillas, right? So I need to tread carefully when I say that people are born to be healers. There are many, many, many passages to becoming a healer. And it is not limited to being umgoma. Umgoma, it is a spiritual institution within the black people. Just like church is a spiritual institution in the culture of Western people. But it does not mean that everybody, for them to qualify as a healer, they necessarily need to belong to a, an institution. This does not mean that there's something wrong with an institution or not being part of an institution is actually cooler and better. It's not about that ego trip. It simply means we all have different paths. Is that clear? Where is the realm of ancestors? Ancestors do not exist in one realm. There are many realms. The reason why some people use candles and will not use snuff Basically, the symbolism that we use in our prayer space, in our libation space, slash hopatha, is indicative of the fact that we are different, number one. And being different, we are going to contact our elders and our ancestors and our gods differently. Does it make sense? So, you will use water, I will use candle. Someone else will use plants and earth, Akir. Some people will use a combination of them. Some people will even make use of A. What represents A? It's prayer, Akir. And sometimes we will use a combination of them. So how you dress and the symbols that you make use of in your prayer space, in your libation space, is indicative of the kind of realm that you are trying to get in touch with and the kind of energy that you are interacting with. 
Brother V spoke in extension about how uh, Brother V is deep, man. I didn't realize we we're going to go that deep. Um, past life memory, living the body, etc. I just want to touch a little bit on our own consciousness in relation to the spirit world and where our ancestors dwell. So I was initiated in 2016. And in 2021, I was ordained as what is called the priest of the gods of light. So my gobela is my elder, for example. My master is my elder, for example. And I have only been given a permission to share with you three places where our ancestors dwell. There's actually nine of them. So I don't want to uh, overwhelm you today. I'm just going to share with you just three of those worlds where our ancestors dwell. And I want to bring that to how does that relate to us. So the first world where our ancestors dwell is called Brija or Ornis or Soda. Now I want to be quick to say we understand that part of our history has been twisted, Akir. And part of our history has been erased and hidden. And I will get into the politics of history briefly at a later stage. So I'm bringing that up so that I answer the question in your head, why is it that we have never heard of these words? Or why have we never heard of these worlds before? It's because that's why we are here so that we can remind ourselves and perhaps bring this lost knowledge back to ourselves. So the first world where our ancestors dwell, it is a home of confusion, a home of anxiety, and a home of chaos. But we will remember the bringer of knowledge, medicine, science, astrology, the being or the God that brought this knowledge to us the god Toth, the god Janti, the god Tehuti. He goes by all those names. What is Tehuti's name, by the way, in Zulu? Kotli. Um, he gave us a principle or a law to say what is above is also below. And what is below, it is also above. So the world... Ornis, for example, also exists in the mind. And that's why today you get a lot of us who chronically suffer from anxiety, who experience a lot of chaos in their lives, as well as confusion. The second world that where our ancestors dwell it is it is named Trahim or Sokar, S-O-K-A-R. It is a place of heat, a place of flame, and a place of constant anger. It's not a cool thing to pride yourself. I need us to come back to that consciousness, to say, umenzi are peaceful beings. When we speak about amen and amenta, we are referring to states of peace and calm. So once you tell us, we know that you're sick. It's not a cool thing. When I was growing up and I was told stories about my granddad and he was a healer, etc., one of the things that they say about him was, and people were afraid of him. That means Umkulu was sick. It is not a fashionable thing for you to pride yourself. And so we see it even with ourselves. There are personalities who struggle with that. We struggle with rage. We struggle with anger. We struggle with, with abuse, right? People who cannot come down. And that is because... There's a projection from another world where our ancestors are that plays out.
So help me welcome Ukoko Obri. Um, I want to start by saying something briefly about two visitors from the United States of America who are here amongst us. I, I asked them for their permission to mention their names, Heidi and Misty. Um, I started by informing them that white people are not allowed here. <coughs> uh, they believed me and almost ran out until I told them I was joking. And, and the reason I want to say welcome home to Heidi and Misty is this. I say welcome home because all of us, eight billion of us on this planet are African. We all have common ancestors from this part of the world. And that is why when I ask the question, how many Africans are there in the diaspora? People will say 5 million, will say 500 million, 5,000, and I say to them, actually, there are 7 billion Africans in the diaspora. 1 billion Africans on the African continent and seven billion Africans in the rest of the world. Because all of us, all of us are African by virtue of having these common ancestors from this part of the world, the cradle of humankind. But the cradle of human, humankind is also the cradle of spirituality, human spirituality, to be precise. And so, Heidi, Misty, welcome home. I will um, say things that at face value seem unconnected in the hope that when you get home, you will do the work of connecting them yourselves. I will not do the connecting for you. And the reason being that I'm a teacher, I taught math, science, and English, and I used to tell my students that I'm not in the business of spoon feeding. In the same spirit, you will connect that seems unconnected yourselves. When you get home, I will not do it for you. I also want to start with an apology. I am going to say things that will unsettle you. I am going to say things that are going to cause you some discomfort. Some of you might even get angry. So I apologize in advance. In fact, we can shorten the whole thing. Just get angry in advance. <laughs> Experience the discomfort in advance. Be unsettled in advance. And then we can move on. So 
Some have labeled me contrarian. And the reason I may appear to be contrarian is because my ancestors tell me many things, teach me many things. One of the things they insist on is that I am not here to conform. By that, they don't mean I am here to be contrarian. By that, they challenge me to always approach issues with an open mind. So I am here armed only with my open mind, nothing else. I hope you are here armed only with your open mind too. Let me start with what I'm wearing. So this will be my first story for today. I'll tell you one or two more stories. Uh, the point of which, as I say, will become clear when you get home. So, night before last, I am shown quite clearly that this is what I'm supposed to wear. And I am shown quite clearly that today they want me in white, in the main, including white beads. Uh, because as my male I decide, no, but you know, there's this thing these days called Sangoma Chic. <laughs> uh, I need a bit of color. So I add red beads. And they say to me, Jonga Apawe, look here, we said white. So uh, we prepare the white beads, they snap. We, we repair them. Ah, they keep quiet. Guess what? I'm not saying it's the fault of Mkuluma Kanya. It may be, but I'm not saying it is. <laughs> While he is speaking, the floor becomes red, full of my bees right here where I'm sitting. And they say to me, Church of Esichilo, we told you so. But this happens at a time when Mkulu Makanya makes a point, and the point is we must avoid over-spiritualizing things. I could easily have said the bees have fallen to the ground for spiritual reasons. Well, the first reason is very basic. The knot was not tight enough. That's why they fell. But there was a spiritual reason. They did say, forget this Sangoma chic thing. We want you in white. Or maybe they meant, forget this Sangoma Lama chic, as in magic or my surname. Maybe I should go back to where I should have started. My name is Obri Magic. Dungupango. Mtumane. Ndize. Langaloglunga, Njoncho, Mkabibi, Msutu, Bobese, Kaulaba Tagat, Ndimlo. And when I was born, my parents gave me the colonial name Aubrey and the Kosa name Mongameli. My Paternal grandmother says before I was born, Lomdana ikamalake liza gubangusi teti. My parents reject the name. Si teti. They say to my grandmother, no, we can't give him that name. Lomdana zao teta grit. Azutula. Now, of course, they were too literal. I think my grandmother always laughs because everything I have done is to follow that name. Siteti, one who speaks, one who speaks on behalf of others. 
Then, uh, after like most of us here, uh, you know, the black middle class, the black middle class is, is a good thing that uh, is going through a spiritual awakening now. But like, like all of us who are black and middle class, I come from a family, Christian and all of that, and I ran away from the calling. And so when I finally decided to, to accept my calling, uh, with the calling came a new name, Utungezweni. Now the name doesn't tell you much until I give you the whole name. Utungezweni Utunga Matula Batagat. Utungezweni Utunga Amayelengwe Amakwecha. That's the full name. And that's my mission. So that's my, as we say, lousy name. Now, of course, when I am given the name, I'm not aware of a particular clan name, Isituko, Sam. That law, Tungezwen, or Tungamatula Batagat. Isituko Sake. So my mission is not only Uktung Amatula Batagat, it is also Ukukaula Abatagat. That is who I am. I lie. I am many things, much more than that. I am more than one thing. I am many things. I, I will come back to this theme later of being many things. My, my wish for all of you is that you all embrace the fact that you are more than one thing. You are many things. And, and part of the attempt at understanding the spiritual realm must include an attempt to embrace the many things you are because you are more than one thing, which therefore means to any question to which you seek an answer, there are many answers, since you are more than one thing. So when I was having this discussion with my ancestors last evening and early hours of this morning about what I should say, one of them says to me, there is something you like saying, repeat it. Because not everyone has had the misfortune of hearing you speak. <laughs> and those who are here today, who are hearing you for the first time, their luck has run out because today they are going to suffer the misfortune. And this thing I like saying is this. We see the world not as it is. We see the world as we are. I'll put it in a different way. It is said that we see the world not as it is, but as we are. Now, as the teacher of English that I am, let me say it this way. It is said, S-A-I-D, that we see the world not as it is, but as we are. It is said, S-A-D, that we see the world not as it is, but as we are. In other words, sadly, we see the world not as it is, but as we are. Which brings me to the point about God. There is God. And this God I call God God, or God full stop. And there is the God of our creation, the God that we and our ancestors have created. Not God, 
the God of our creation. This God, for instance, is a Christian. This God is black. This God is an African. This God is white. This God is a man. This God is a woman. This God is a Muslim. This God is Buddhist. This God is a Hindu. This God believes in Af African spirituality. This God hates homosexuals. And this God hates those who do not see the world as this God sees the world. This is the God of our creation. And I want to tell you this is not God. Then there is God full stop. The same applies to what we call the ancestors. They are what I call the ancestors, full stop, and the ancestors of our creation. These are not the ancestors as they are. These are the ancestors as we are. So a lot of what we say about the ancestors is not what they are. It is what we are. And it is for this reason we humanize them so much. They speak particular languages. They eat food. They like this food. They don't like this food. They hate this. They love that. They are oko oko. They are omkulu because we humanize them. These are the ancestors not as they are. These are the ancestors as we are. We give them human attributes, attributes that have either nothing or very little to do with them. These are not the ancestors. These are the ancestors as we are, not as they are. Let me say one or two things about one of the ways in which we humanize the ancestors. But maybe before I go to that, what do I mean when I talk about the ancestors? Firstly, I talk about or I am talking about a historical fact. There are human beings who were here before us. It's a historical fact. It's not a spiritual fact. It's not a matter of spirituality. There are human beings who were here before us. That's a historical fact. So when I talk about the ancestors, the first way in which I'm talking about them, I am talking about them as the historical fact of human beings were here before us. But I'm also talking about the fact that they are not here anymore. Those who were here before us. Your grandfather is not here. Your great-grandfather is not here. Your grandmother, your great-grandmother, great-great-great-grandmother is not here. Was here, but is not here. They are spirit. That's the second way in which I talk about them. I talk about them as spirit. So let me come to one of the ways in which, or one of the many ways in which we humanize the ancestors. And, and, and before I continue, let me also say this. I did say that my ancestors call, say to me, I am not here to conform. By here, I mean the world. I'm not in the world to conform. But it is not their expectation that I should be arrogant or contrarian. All they are asking me is to always arm myself with an open mind. Today, I am not here to agree. 
Today, I am not here to disagree. Today, I am here to share. <laughs> to share what I think. To share what I believe. Because there is very little I know. I am not here to share what I know. At best, I am also here to share how I experience my relationship with the ancestors. Some of whom are from my bloodline, some of whom are not from my bloodline, some of whom are from this continent, some of whom are from other continents. So I'm here to share what I think, what I believe, I am not here to share, I'm not here to agree or disagree. The topic is about the ancestral realm. Let me start by saying, first of all, I don't believe in death. Death does not exist. To the extent that death exists, death is a coma, is but a coma in a sentence. The sentence before the coma is life before what we call death. And the sentence after the coma is life after what we call death. For me, there's only life. There is no death. What we call death to me is but a coma, just a pause. There is no death. Now, when it comes to the nature of the spirit, I do not believe there is a realm or a world of the spirits. I believe that spirit is everywhere. And therefore, spirit simultaneously is nowhere and everywhere. There is no realm, a location, geographical, spiritual, or otherwise, where the spirits reside. And therefore, there is no spiritual realm. There is no human realm. For me, there is a single realm. All of the things we've been talking about this morning happen in the same realm. There is no realm separate from another. All the things we've been talking about today, the things we talk about when we discuss spirituality, happen in the same realm. There is no spiritual realm that is separate from the human realm. Which brings me to the question of being human. We call ourselves human beings. Human beings. If we are human beings, that means there are other ways of being. Being human is not the only way of being. There are other ways of being. We can be in more ways than being human. That's the implication. If we are human beings, then two things, more than two arise, but I will state two. Two things arise. We can be in ways more than being human. And the challenge, therefore, and the invitation I am making to you is to begin the journey of finding out in what other ways can you be other than being human. If there are human beings and therefore being human is but one way of being, we must therefore accept 
that there are other beings and these beings are not human. I've taken a circuitous route to this question. I accept being called a Gogo, not because I'm a Gogo. Okay, I, I do look beautiful, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I will use the term realm because sometimes it does not assist us not to use words that are commonly used. So I will use the word realm despite what I've just said. The spiritual realm is bigger than the ancestral realm. The ancestral realm is a subset of the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is not the totality. I mean, the ancestral realm is not itself the totality of the spiritual realm. It is but a subset of the spiritual realm. The spiritual realm is something much larger than the ancestral realm. The spiritual realm is not a gendered realm. It is not masculine. It is not feminine. It is not a realm of those who are male or female. It is therefore not a realm of Ogogo Nomkul because it is a non-gendered realm. But then, why do I accept being called Ogogo? And why do I call others Ogogo? And why do I call others Omkulu? And why do I accept it when others call me Omkulu? This is where I want to talk to you about the mind, the human mind. Descartes says, I think, therefore, I am. In my view, there is nothing more nonsensical than that. What is closer to the truth is this. I think, therefore, I am limited. It is because I think that I am limited. I think because I rely on the mind, and the mind is limited. And therefore, what you call knowledge, if not always, is almost always limited as a product of the mind. But I sometimes distinguish between the mind and the brain. So what am I using here now as I speak to you? Am I using the brain? Or am I using the mind? Or am I using both? For me, the brain is that physical entity in that cavity. The mind is a particular relationship between this physical thing, the brain, and consciousness. That is the mind. And the mind, as I said, is limited. Limited by another thing. I won't go into the whole story. We don't have time. I will just state this in passing. The mind is limited by another thing. By the fact that one of the things the mind produces is knowledge. But think about it. Knowledge is always in the past. Think about anything you know. Do you know it in the present or in the past? Is it something from the present or something from the past? If you say it is from the present, I can't agree with you because the moment I say it, one second later it is in the past. Knowledge is almost always in the past, and therefore knowledge is limited, like the mind. Which means, therefore, when you stand here, when you have a conversation with the people next to you, ask yourself, am I engaging with the mind or the brain or both? 
given the fact that the mind is a very useful instrument, but a limited instrument nonetheless. So because the mind is limited, I want to issue another invitation. I want to invite you to stop being slaves to the known. You must not be a slave to the known. You must free yourself from the known. That is not the same as saying you must know nothing. All I mean is that when something becomes the known, the journey to free yourself from that known must begin until you reach another known. And when you reach that other known, the journey to free yourself from that known must begin. And therefore, when we pose questions, whether it is about the ancestors, about God or anything, we must remember that we are on a journey of exploration. We are traveling towards the answer. Does the answer exist? Yes, it does exist. That you have not found it does not mean it does not exist. Yes, it does exist. But here's the trick. The moment you find the answer, if truly you are not a slave to the known, if truly you are free from the known, Um, I think we'll join the, the panel. Uh, you can take a seat, Kok. Umkulu Makanya will join us, and Uvus Muzungande will also join us. Yes, now. <laughs> um, I'm about to start. Hi. Suzoza, if you're about to see the Kok, put it by. Imbuzu kona na. Yai nami ngawez. No koko ngapai. Usebenzi. Usebenzi. Who? Are we okay? Do we need a couple of moments just to stretch maybe a bit? Eh? You know where you are. We are not moving. We are not going outside. Just to move a bit. You know, just uglula inyao, abom bonzi, you know, because of ya. Ha! Whew! We are going to start with the five questions and see how they might be answered by our panel and take it from there. House lights, please. Thank you. I'm going to take rounds of threes, then it's born. 
a hand there. So one, two, three. Ikeng in Nane, Auzagi. Number two. Togoza, someone. Uh, so my question is around, um, and Goko, you touched on this, that um, if there are human beings, then there are obviously other forms of beings. And my question essentially relates to um, our, our beliefs in terms of, uh, a, for lack of a better term, uh, alien beings. And if we do connect to beings that are living, for example, in a different planet or universes, do we traverse that? Do we sort of have that? That like, I don't know, in the council, it's just that it's not only we're talking to um, people that will become human beings or spirits that will become human beings, but spirits that will become other beings in galaxies far, far away. What's the question? The question is that, so like, um, what is our feel? What is the understanding or, con or connection that we have with with that? Yeah. I watched uh, the X Files <laughs> and Star Trek. That's as far as I go. <laughs> uh, there are other life forms out there. And if you've been following, the US currently is even setting up uh, security forces because they are convinced that um, there are beings from other planets who are coming into our space to to cause harm. But uh, during a period that we called Corona, you know, that's also the time when, when, when they came in um, and they, they came to come and help humanity. So just like you get good and evil on all levels, on all realms, um, some of these beings are good, some of them are bad. Uh, but to answer your question, that there are other life forms other than human beings. Can I add to that? Um, when you follow the, the research that I was talking about that talks about um, past life regression, it has actually happened that some people recall past lives where they were actually not human, where they were um, beings from, from another planet. I think for me, I tend to sort of stay away from that because there's a point in which some information gets too complicated. Um, and I, I was, someone was asked me, like, would you do past life regression yourself? Personally, I wouldn't do it. Um, you can if you feel that it's something that is important. But I feel like you'll be tapping into too much information. You know, So that would, that's my stance. Um, from my understanding from what I've read and what I've heard, there is that kind of existence w where, you know, we, we, we come from, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a book called Convoluted Universe, and they talk about how you have, the human soul wasn't only just the human soul, right? It's also, it's also within the, the space of um, past life regression, where people could trace back their lifetime into creator beings who created the planet. Someone would say, um, example, when, when the practitioner is, is guiding, through, guiding them through their life, he's like, what are you? He's like, I'm a cloud. What's happening? The earth is forming. We have to cool down the earth so that um, life can form. What are you? I'm a river. Um, and 
you know, it, it can go on and on and on in terms of what you define as alien life, you know, because in a sense, um, I think Mkuli said it as well, that we have been something else, you know. Maybe then the question is, to what is your, is it a human soul that you have? Because we, you know, because if you believe that your soul you have is not human soul, then it's easier then to understand that you could have been anything, anywhere. Sorry about that. Before number two, I like that you went there. So now there is research and even um, structures build up. I'm, I'm forgetting the, 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 the scientific term of it, where they are building robots that are programmed to be able to see the afterlife, for instance. So for me, it, it goes to, are we really sharing a lot to a point where now scientists are mimicking the physical and even the subconscious of human beings? Where, where can we draw the line in essence? Or should we now allow like just allow this train, just this car to pass through and whoever can grasp whatever they can pick up on what, on the certain level of speed they can pick up on. Um, I've, been, I've been following the developments in AI um, quite closely um, and what the capabilities are um, that, that are coming. And for me, there's a way in which I feel as though spirituality is going to be the last line for human beings because it's going to be the one thing that technology can't replicate because it is not situated anywhere within the human physique and in the world, if, if, if you get what I mean. Um, so are we sharing a lot? I believe so. I believe that, you know, the, the, the tech industry is pushing too hard in the wrong direction. And I also feel that for the healers in the room, you have to be very cognizant of the generation that is coming, right? Um, if you've seen all the AI pictures, the, um, the do we have the, the poster? Can you put up the poster for the event, if you can? As they put it up, can we have number three? Number two. <coughs> oh. Okay. Um, let me let me gear so that we don't run over. Anyway, if you've seen the poster for this event, for that event, that was an AI generated image. Right? It's not, a, it's not a photo. No one took that picture. Mm. And I did it deliberately because I actually wanted it to be a point of discussion. Right? You are getting into a time where you won't know if what you're seeing is real or not. Right? It's going into video, it's going into voice, it's going into everything. Right? So, ni nabo koko nabo mkul. Right now, you may be dealing with clients that say, um, koko, you know, Things are not going well for me. I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand my problems. The next generation is going to say, Koko, I don't know what is real. I don't know what to feel about anything. If you look at uh, the impact that AI is going to have on jobs, it's going to be, Koko, I don't even know what to do with myself. So you have to imagine what kind of sickness is actually coming. Right? So. Are we sharing too much? Yes, definitely. And the change is coming, and in many ways, the change is already here. Um, and the point that I wanted to make, sorry, um, it's just that because I talk too much, I ran over time. The point about information. Information is, is getting much more readily available, right? And hence I said, the thing I shared with you is just information. Soon, information is going to be available everywhere. The issue is not going to be information the issue is going to be insights and experience. The next coming commodity 
is going to be human experiences. When people are, are, are stuck in unreal world with images, our history is about to get distorted in ways we don't understand. Because the, the, the kids are gonna be seeing pictures like, is it, did, did this really happen? Were there black Chinese? Were there this, were there that? There's no picture that is going to be believable from this point onwards. Sure. Okay. Yes, please. Dumelang. Um, so I'm going to get into my, my question. Um, Ogogo Obri spoke about not framing and boxing, you know, from words and stones and identifying things with words, right? So the question that I'm getting into, and it's also coming from a perspective of a young architect, is that um, we come from a place where, as black people, only after a certain point in time where black Africans are allowed to study architecture as well as build. So for me, um, I'll start with a statement which is for me, resonates with me, which is, for me, memorialization is about preserving African spirituality, grounding and unraveling the stigmas that have been created around the interconnectedness of the physical and metaphysical forms of it. And then, now what I'm trying to understand is, how do you then create a space where you can preserve this African spirit, spirituality and like ancestors to, for, for, for the future as well, whereby you, it's, it's such an uncertain space. It's also so intangible. So how would, as a collective, this is a quick question for a collective, because I think if you're creating a space for such a group of people where um, it's been put down, how do we then create and design a space in such a way that there's that uncertainty, but there's also the interconnectedness of it where you can find grounding within those spaces, even if it's not one space. Um, <clears throat> you don't look like people who have just had lunch. You look hungry. <laughs> uh, you look tired. Can we play a game? Simple game. I'll ask a question and you just say yes or no, all of you. You just say yes or no. Is gender a construct? Yes. Is identity a construct? Yes. Is Kosa identity a construct? Yes. Is Sutu identity a construct? Yes. Is black identity a construct? Yes. Is white identity a construct? Yes. Is African identity a construct? Yes. Ah, now you hesitate. <laughs> You've been coming along very well. Now, once you start hitting Africa, we start to hesitate. No, 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 don't touch Africa. Don't touch. Now you are touching us in the studio. African identity, like all other forms of identity, is a construct. It is socially constructed. Mm -hmm. And therefore, what is African spirituality? Is it not a construct? I'm not saying it is or it is not. I'm just asking a question. If African ID, being African is socially constructed and therefore is a construct, is African spirituality a construct? That's not the same as saying there is no spirituality. That is not the same as saying our essence is not spiritual. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just asking the question. Well, in fact, I'm not asking the question. I'm just asking, I'm just making another invitation to think a bit deeper about what has been obvious maybe up to now, that there is such a thing called African spirituality. If being African is a construct, how does that implicate African spirituality? That is the question um, I'm asking. And maybe just a final point on on the mind about why I say the spiritual realm is, is, is not a gendered realm. Abadala is nyanya, the ancestors, are super pragmatic. That's how I experience them. I experience them as being super pragmatic, which means they know, they understand the limitations of the human mind. And that is why Spirit will present itself to you as uko oko, because your mind is limited. If the spirit presents itself as it is, you will not recognize it. 
So it must present itself to you in a way that your mind will recognize. Not that it is male, no. Not that it is female. It presents itself in that way because your mind is so limited. If it presented itself as it is, you would not be able to recognize it. Oh, want to add on that? <laughs> what number are we on? Are you, are you okay? I'm, I'm not too sure if I'm okay yet. Because I think, I mean, with everything that I do know about Khopata and Umsamo and everything else, where in most cases it starts within you before anything else. It's not a physical structure. Mm -hmm. But I was maybe trying to understand what would be the appropriate thing to do if we were trying to, like, preserve that knowledge? For me, I think in, in simple terms, it would be or like the easiest way out. Because of we are being, you know, but let's go deeper. The, the easy way out, while we are still trying to go deeper, is for us to, to go through via, you know, Vosi route to document what is happening now. And if we were, if, I mean, the Americans, they can have museums for anything. But I'm not saying we should. But for, to answer you, to plant that seed, would, would a museum to document the work, to hold the work, and not to overshare because of their busy now. You will be consulting a robot gogo soon. <laughs> we are heading there, you know. But then that will be the easy way out uh, to, ho to have for you, you know, we want to see the brick and mortar coming together to hold space for all this knowledge system. The little bit that we can have is to have this structure and hold what we have now. Have this conversation as part of the archives of that place to say, ha, ah, they were there on the 29th and they saw that there's an evolution coming and it will be 100 years from, from now, and it was like, okay, they, they, something was happening, and they were able to document it, and then they will, they will find a way how to go deeper, because I don't think that we are ready now. For someone who talks a lot, I actually don't know what to say. Um, thank you for coming. About a month ago, I was a team of one. Today, I'm like a team of 20. It took a lot of people to put this together. A lot. Um, people who I would have never met outside of this. This is work that was given to me. And on the council table, before we all sat like this and we agreed that on this day we'll hook up and help each other. Um, so I'm grateful for that. Um, and beyond that, I don't have much to say. All I can say is my name is Vasum Zinglande. <laughs> Thank you for joining me on the very first The Journey Gone to Live. Um, close without something we are not gonna yeah. the name of the track is called kingdom come um sorry v. yes i've been people have been asking me whether we are yes, related sir. and i get it all yeah, the yeah, time yeah 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 have you been get, so please uh, uh, yeah, yeah, hey. <laughs> no me and kulu are not related um i'm a big fan of his work maybe that's why i'm like a groupie um i called you here yeah. in order to talk about yeah, something yeah, very yeah, heavy. Yeah. Um, I wanted to talk, can we turn it down a bit? The song gets weird after 30 seconds. That's why I always turn it down. Um, for us to talk about the ancestral realm, 
and what happens there. My hope was that we will be able to look at life from the perspective of our guides, to ask ourselves, what will happen when we get there? Because we have, we have a tendency to, to view the social realm, the spiritual realm as a place that we are not going to go to. And my belief is that if we actually understand better, or if you can view life from the perspective of our ancestors, the one who live in the spiritual townships, the higher beings, we can actually understand where we are. But something that we really do in African spirituality what we do most often is to ask for things and ask for guidance. But we, what we very rarely do is to pray for our ancestors. We never ask for them to be okay and pray for them and for them to get light, for those who are stuck in the places that they don't want to be or they shouldn't be, right? So in closing, I would like us to do a prayer where we are going to pray for our ancestors. We're going to pray for our guides, all of them. Today, that's how we're going to honor them. Not ask them for anything, but pray for them. And to do that, I'm going to ask Ubusle Bendalo to come onto stage. Zake 
Siavuma, Siavuma, Tanzega, 